Patricia O'Toole is an award-winning biographer and a former professor in the School of Arts at Columbia University. She's also a fellow of the Society of American Historians, and she's written five books and worked on the one we'll be discussing today while a public policy scholar here at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Here's the book. It's titled The Moralist, Woodrow Wilson and the World He Made. Patricia, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, John. Great to have you here. So the 50th anniversary of the Wilson Center, the 100th anniversary of the 14 Points speech. You were telling me that you started this book almost a decade plus ago, and yet your timing is flawless. That was a lucky break, <laughs> absolutely lucky break. So why did you decide to write about Woodrow Wilson and how did you end up you know, using this framing device of him as a moralist? I decided to write about him because I was fascinated with World War I. I had done another book about Theodore Roosevelt that after he was president, there's a lot of World War I in it. So I wanted to stick with World War I and um, Wilson in a roundabout way turned out to be my best choice. And I think of biographies as portraits, and I think they need a focus. Um, so I went looking for a focus. What was the central thing that I saw? About Did you have one in mind when you? Not in the beginning. No, I had to wander around for quite a long time in uh, what somebody has called the bewilderness. <laughs> um, and uh, what I was struck by over and over again was his use of a phrase, moral force, mm. and he thought. I mean, here we are just after the beginning of the 20th century. Most Americans are very proud of the fact that the country is now the richest country in the world. And Wilson is thinking in a different way. He's thinking, if we're going to be a great nation, it will not be because we're the most wealthy nation in the world. It will be because we have moral force of, and what he meant by that was, the authority that you have when you're a democratic nation and democracies are the best kind of government. So the that's world. the source of your moral authority yes. is democracy. Yes. Yeah, and, and for uh, him. For yeah. him. Yeah. And a lot of people would have assumed the son of a preacher man that this may have to tied, be tied to his father's profession. I think it was tied somewhat. He certainly was a devout Christian all his life, and there are lots of Presbyterian ministers in the family tree. But um, it seemed to me that uh, his civic ideals were even more important, at least in uh, the way he governed the country. And those ideals are the ones that the founding fathers kinds of ideals. Back to democracy. So it's not really democracy. Christianity. Democracy is right. the religion. Right. Yeah. He, he had as much faith in democracy as I think he had in God. I mean, hmm. That might be a bit of a stretch, but democracy was a kind of faith with him for sure. Was his, his emergence as a great orator tied to watching his dad on the, at the pulpit? He admired his father's uh, sermons, but he never wanted to be a preacher. Um, he started learning about statesmen when he was a teenager, and he just set his sights on that. He wanted to do this in a secular way, not in a religious way. Was there a moment or a tipping point in your thinking about him where this, this version of Woodrow Wilson emerged clearly? It was, I was pretty far along, actually, before I decided uh, the, on the title. Uh, I mean, it was probably like year nine uh, oh. of 11 when I decided on the title. Um, but that theme just kept, I, I just noticed it emerging in just about every chapter, that there's a moral dimension that's quite prominent in everything that he's trying to do as president. Speaking of faith, it sounds like a, a leap of faith on, on the author's part to uh, have this notion that eventually that will emerge, that clarity of how you're going to frame the entire story. It, it, it is a leap of faith. Um, you have to be content, or I do anyway, have to be content wandering around not knowing exactly what I'm doing until very late in the process. I, I never feel on top of a book until I'm in the last year of working on it. Interesting. The, the, um, the whole notion of uh, him as a globalist, or however you would define that, someone with a global view, w what did you find out about his past that indicated that this was who Woodrow Wilson would become? I don't know that you can predict it from his past, um, but once World War I began and he thought about uh, what had caused it, he was convinced that, I mean, he didn't have these ideas overnight, but he was convinced that uh, hyper-nationalism of the sort that the German Empire and to some degree the French and the British were engaging in in their imperial adventures, um, you know, that that created large army, armies and navies, large uh, rivalries, national rivalries, and um, uh, a wish to expand the empire kind of thing. And, that that, and, and then 
they were finding their security in these alliances that were ever shifting. So he didn't think that was a very secure way to, uh, to have peace in the world. And in fact, it's why World War I broke out so quickly all over the world, because you know, one of your allies goes in, then you have to go in too. Um, so that, that was a dangerous thing. And he just wanted to see if there was a way to organize the world that did not involve these competing alliances. So his idea was to turn the entire world into an alliance through the League of Nations. In some way, I, I hear your answer, and, and my summary is he thought it through, and it made sense to him. You describe a man who was very deliberative, no one who, not shooting from the hip, not like our current President Trump, who has great mm -hmm. faith in his instincts. The, he's the anti-Trump in that regard. He's not an instinctive politician at all. In fact, I think um, one of the characteristics that stands out for me with him is restraint. You know, he's not shooting from the hip. He's quite an emotional man. He always feels that he's sitting on his emotions. Um, he, he said once about himself that he was a, a far from extinct volcano, you know, <laughs> and just kind of always having to sit on his, his feelings. Um, and he did want to think things through, yes. That, that contradiction of, of an emotional man, as you've described him several times, but then who had an, a self-awareness to contain that emotion in this deliberative process, it, it speaks to these contradictions. The moralist also had a lot of moral blind spots. C could you reconcile those? Is there any way to explain them or reconcile them? Or is this just the way that humans can be contradictory? I think it's difficult to reconcile him with reconcile them with his morality and his his attitudes on race, for example, were anything but progressive. And yet, uh, that issue, when people would come to talk to him about it and try to get him to undo the segregation of the civil service, which happened first when he was president, um, it upset him a lot. These discussions, and I think it's because he knew he didn't have the moral high ground mm. on that issue. And he would absolutely. If actually, he knew he was wrong, why didn't he, with this, with this great logical power and this deliberative power, why couldn't he convince himself to change his mind? He he needed Southern votes to pass his big economic reform package. So this was the price, the political price that had to be paid. Um, the Southerners saw the things like the Federal Reserve Board um, and the modern income tax as uh, greatly expanding federal authority, and they worried that once that had happened in economic affairs, that it would expand to other things and it would be the end of segregation and all the state laws that supported it. So they wanted a sign from the Wilson administration that he was not going to go in that direction. And this is, it was the segregation. So he essentially facility. traded race for yes, that progress yes, on race. Yes, he did. And um, the conflict actually, uh, you know, when he had to deal with it face to face with his critics, it made him sick, physically ill. Yes. You know, we have a, when we interview authors in this context, we, I, I'm asking you questions as if you met the man and had him on the couch in your therapy sessions. <laughs> but this notion of getting inside the head of the protagonist, uh, describe to us what your process is. I never think about it in the language that um, psychology would use. Uh, because I'm not a professional in that field, and many of the professionals in that field, who uh, Wilson is an interesting person to look at in that way. There's a huge psychological literature about him. Um, but I, and I read it all and thought about it, and it seems to me that it reduces him. You know, it's like, oh, it was his problems with his father. Mm -hmm. Oh, it was that his mother wasn't, his mother was ill a lot and wasn't attentive. And to me, that just doesn't, you know, there are a lot of people who have problems with their father who don't turn out to be. Yeah, it's too linear. Yeah, it's too it's too small, actually. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so speaking of process, what about your your writing process? My writing process. Yeah. What's well, the secret to writing a good book? Well, the secret to writing a good book. Other is, than eleven years of your life. Yes. Uh, <laughs> my writing process is to tear out my hair every day till I'm done. That's, <laughs> that's the process. But the, uh, I think um, this is going to sound flip, but. Um, you have to find an uncommonly good story and tell it uncommonly well. And I used to say th this to my students, my writing students at Columbia, and they would say, oh, come on, you know. That, uh, but you would be surprised. No, no, you wouldn't. You go to the bookstore all the time. There are many books where the story is just basically not much, mm -hmm. you know, and then it's not particularly well written. So right. it is 
it is a formula that's just a good story hard well told. To do. Yeah. yeah, the the um, uh, the self righteousness that emerged uh, later in this man started off righteous, became self righteous. Yes, is that the momentum of the isolation of being president? I think it was the um, a couple of things. One is for the first six years of his presidency, he has majorities in both the House and the Senate. So he gets his way about a lot of things because he has the votes. Um, and after six years of that, you could start to think you were right about everything, you know? Mm -hmm. Then it changes in 1918, and he doesn't course correct nearly enough uh, to take account of the fact that he's now a minority president. And this is when the righteousness hardens into self-righteousness and becomes a kind of uh, moral vanity. And uh, if, we, if you and I have opposing ideas, uh, and I'm Woodrow Wilson, I'm thinking, well, my idea is morally superior to yours. And this was, of course, infuriating to Republicans who just had a different worldview. So they're uh, just not wrong, they're inferior. Yeah, they're morally Morally inferior. wanting. Yes, yes. The, the, um, you, you describe him, speaking of his relationship with Republicans, as an intensely partisan figure. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to talk about our current time as if it's partisanship unlike what the world has ever seen. Is that your observation, or, or were these harshly partisan times in, in a different way? Things got, um, uh, the Republicans were upset with Wilson um, because he didn't appreciate all that they had contributed to his the war legislation that he needed. You know, a lot of Southerners and a lot of Midwesterners, uh, many Democrats, opposed entering the war. They didn't see what uh, European affairs had to do with the United States. But the Republicans kind of had a more global view than many Democrats did at the time. And he, he didn't really appreciate their uh, contributions to things. So um, things turned very ugly in 1918. This notion that, uh, for all of us, our greatest strengths can emerge as our greatest yes, weaknesses, yeah. is that the story of Wilson when it comes to the end game? It is. It's part of the story. And then the other thing that happens, of course, is his health is deteriorating. Well, there's the physical aspect as even, well. Even before he has his big stroke. Um, so, uh, yeah, but um, he's he finds himself in this unfamiliar position of being a minority president. And he says, well, the president is the only public official who's elected by all the people. I'm going to be president for another 21 months. They're going to have to do what I want them to do. And the big fight, of course, was over ratification of the Treaty of Versailles, which contained the League of Nations Covenant. And um, he would not, he just would not deal with How, them. Was it a, would, would we have to have made major concessions or would it just no, they were minor quite, concessions they and he could have quite, had his dream? Yes, he, he could have had 99% of his dream. So it's really a That's shame. It's tragic. It is tragic. It's yeah. absolutely tragic. And um, it's, it's hard to sort out how much of that is just the stubbornness that he always had that he used to good effect. You know, stubbornness and determination can be good qualities up to a point. Um, and Oh, and how, of it, how much of it was the sort of rigidification that happens um, with a stroke, mm -hmm. you know, that uh, he no longer, he certainly wasn't thinking as straight as he thought before the stroke. The, the, I should mention, uh, the, the, I know one of the questioners asked you how much his physical situation factored in in the book event you just did at the Wilson Center. So I'll tell the people watching our shorter interview that uh, if you'd like to hear a 90-minute session with Patricia, uh, talking about the book that's available on the Wilson Center website as well. The the speaking of being nonlinear, I want to go back to putting Woodrow Wilson on the couch and your ability to get inside the heads of your subjects. Relatively speaking, from whether it's Teddy Roosevelt who you've written about or others, is he was he easier to get to know, more difficult to get to know than some of the other people you've studied? He he's very difficult to get to know. He likes being by himself. Um, he likes thinking things through. Uh, by himself, he really needed more advice than he allowed himself to have. Um, often, there are many uh, comments by cabinet members of, well, he came in with a decision that he'd already made up his mind about and read us his statement that he's going to make to the press, rather than talking it over with the cabinet and getting some input. Um, and it's not, he really did try to think from a lot of angles, but you know, the, the sad thing is that no one individual can see it all. So, 
I know I've, I've heard enough from you and read enough and uh, uh, that I know that you prefer to talk about him as consequential versus great. Yes. Could you talk about the distinction in trying to rank presidents and why you think that the best way to think about Woodrow Wilson is as a consequential president? Yes. Um, we have these polls every year of uh, presidential greatness and there's a kind of ranking. And I think they're they're useful and tell us some interesting things, particularly when there's a change in standing. And Wilson fell from uh, number six in 2016 to number 10 in uh, 2017. Um, I think it has a lot to do with the racial issue. Um, and also his internationalism is falling out of favor. So, uh, but does it mean that because somebody goes down the ladder that you don't pay as much attention to him anymore? And I think that would be a shame with Wilson because if you think about the most consequential presidents, um, and consequential could be positive, could be negative, right. unlike great, where we're thinking of uh, just positive. Parades. Parades, you know. yes. And it, it almost is verges towards sports a little bit. Right. Um, so, but if you think of consequential, uh, he was certainly, he would always be in the top four. Transformational, another uh, word. Transformational, yes. You think yes, so? Yeah. Yes. Um, his, his, his idea of uh, kind of an international order and a, and a place um, that would, uh, you know, where all the nations of the world would work together to stop aggression um, and war. Um, that was a revolutionary idea. For some of the factors you listed, so things like the, when we apply contemporary standards to historical figures or just the current nationalistic movement globally where some of his views have fallen out of favor, does that add up to Woodrow Wilson being underrated as a president? I think it's part of why he's um, why he has fallen in the in the league tables. Yeah. 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 That at the end, uh, how much of the world today, the title, the world he made, are, are you suggesting through the title that the world we're living in is a reflection of Woodrow Wilson's vision? I think it's, um, you, you know, people, he, the League of Nations, the United States never joined the League of Nations. The Senate never ratified the Treaty of Versailles. So Wilson leaves office a defeated man. And then when World War II happens, his stock goes down even further. People say, see, that League of Nations didn't work. Look mm -hmm. where we are now. But um, FDR was a committed internationalist. FDR had spent World War I as a member of Wilson's administration, Assistant Secretary of the Navy, watching everything. You know, he's obviously studying for his own future, thinking about what works and what doesn't work. And very soon after the United States entered World War II, uh, Roosevelt assembled a group of people to work on a successor to the League of Nations. So you can, and he had a lot of advice on it, whereas Woodrow Wilson was trying to figure this out all by himself. It was his kind of pet uh, project. Um, and he would occasionally listen to others who came to him with ideas about things, but it was really his baby. It wasn't like he was one of the founding fathers, you know? Yeah. Um, so um, FDR is not like that. You know, he has a different temperament. So he's got a lot of advisors from the start. And, he, and some historians think that what FDR did was throw out Wilson and the League and start over. But other historians think, and, and I agree with them, that, that uh, the UN is basically Wilson 2.0 mm -hmm. because there are many, there's a lot of language um, in the UN Charter that's lifted straight from the, the League of Nations. Well, the, the, um, the basic framework of a cooperating right, global body, you right. can't get past that. Um, but um, FDR thought, and his advisors thought, well, first of all, FDR saw right away that he should, with this idea, build bipartisan support from the beginning, which is something that Wilson had not done. Um, and then FDR and his advisors thought that uh, the League of Nations had been asked to do too many things. So they just created not just the UN, but other organizations, this is where things like the World Bank and the IMF come from, and NATO is founded, you know. Uh, so we have kind of a, a structure of many structures, um, some of them regional and some of them global. So you think if he was with us today, he'd be uh, proud or horrified? Um, today, he'd probably be very sad. He'd be wondering again, can the world be made safe for democracy because we have the rise of uh, dictators around the world. We have 
uh, inroads on democracy in even some of the most democratic nations on earth. We have b things like Brexit, you know, um, the, the world, the old order which we've been living with, not since Wilson, but since FDR's revision of what I think of as FDR's revision of Wilson. Um, it's, it's, it might be time for FDR 2.0. Well, the, the a final thought, Patricia, is um, you you mentioned in the previous session that someone else will write a book about Wilson. The story is never finally told, and there have been previous books about Wilson. So there's no final word on this president. History is a moving target. But if, if we were going to give you the final word now, how do you sum up Woodrow Wilson as a man or, or as a president or as both? I see his story as um, a cautionary tale, uh, really, about how you, you think you have it all figured out. You, you know, you think that the secret to being a great president is great oratory and having high principles. And then when you hit a big bump in the road, like you lose control of Congress and those things don't work, you can't keep on doing the same thing. So moral leadership looks uh, very appealing. When um, you have the numbers, it uh, looks good too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, but it can't just be that, and it can't just be oratory. You know, it has. It's a very uh, complex thing, as as uh, you know, recent presidents I think would well, attest. Well, thank you for the cautionary tale, and it's much more than that. A terrific book. Thanks for joining us. Congratulations on the book. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm glad you like the book. Pleasure.